Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you a little bit about business, investment opportunity, how you get that funding. We have a ton of information, but uh, I love the energy. It is super, super cool to see everything that's happening here. So let's dive in. I mean, when it comes to entrepreneurship, everybody, they just think that everyone's got the dream. And everyone thinks that uh, so many people think that money is just going to just fall from the sky because that's just how it works. But I can tell you that is not how it works when it comes time to talking to people. I mean, it's just like that safe is locked and you cannot get it open. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we why that is the case and how we can unlock that safe and uh, somewhat it will surprise you in terms of uh, what, the, what the secrets are to do that. But a little bit about me first so that you know who I am, why you should even listen to me. I've been in the startup space, the entrepreneurial space since 2012. It has been my life's work ever since, uh, since that time. Star Peninsula, if you all are not familiar with it, you should become familiar with it. So this year, the city of Newport News is the host locality, starpeninsula.com. It's a pitch competition, so to speak. We do a series of micro pitches, but long story short, companies have gone on to raise millions of dollars in capital as a result, but that is the way to get plugged into the larger ecosystem within Hampton Roads. I started a business incubator in Greater Williamsburg companies there went on to raise millions of dollars in funding, quickly became the uh, best, best incubator in the region. I transitioned away from that and uh, been working with an organization called Innovate Hampton Roads. We are the storyteller for the region. So we want to showcase all the successes that you all have so that we can build the story of what's happening so there's great things happening in Newport News. There's great things happening across Hampton Roads. And when we can get people to understand what Hampton Roads is and who we are, then we can continue to raise more money that can go into to, uh, to new businesses and expand that. I've also, uh, I'm, I transitioned into the angel investing side. As a result of Star Peninsula, Jason Calacanis came here to Newport News. Uh, but he is the first investor in Robinhood Com, third or fourth investor in Uber. So he's done really, really well for himself. But with that, he told me, he gave me the, the plan. He laid it out to me what I needed to do. Since then, I've invested in 30, 30 companies, ranging from seed stage, pre-revenue companies to, uh, to SpaceX. And I also manage the... Uh, the high tech space for the city of Hampton called Reactor. Behind, uh, behind the scenes is James. I'm a pretty humble guy. He makes me seem like I'm like the opposite of humble. But James and I are working this together to, uh, we, we want to tell your story and showcase you all. But let's get into the investor mindset. I mean, it's just, people have, I guess this, the phrase is people have deep pockets but short arms they just can't get into those pockets to share that money but i want to get into that that mindset so that you all understand the way that they think and with that i hear great ideas all the time the, the, the problem is is that ideas are not worth they're not worth anything we need to validate those ideas and so that's where Star Peninsula comes into play. We, it's a platform to validate those business ideas. And what I mean by that is we need to find out if people are really literally going to be buying what it is that you're selling. So we validate those business ideas. That's step one. Now you've got investors' attention because they want to see a return on that capital. You also have to keep in mind that investors that are full-time investors, they're getting pitched multiple times a day from everybody. Text messages, phone calls, emails. I mean, there are constantly, there are more ideas than there is capital to go around. So what they're looking for is, is de-risked opportunities. And we're gonna talk about how you de-risk those so that you have a higher chance of receiving capital. Um, 
90% of companies are going to fail. We're going to prevent that from happening. But the big thing is, is that why you? Why are you the ones to, to solve that problem? And investors invest in the people. They don't invest in the idea. So um, every investor is different. And what I mean by that is every, every investor has a, a thesis. They have an area in which they're experts in, and they stick to that area. Every investor has a stage in the, uh, of their business life cycle that they want to invest in. Some want to invest really, really early. Some people want to invest really, really late. So as a business owner, you need to understand what type of investor that you're talking to. If you're talking to someone who goes in really, really late and you're really, really early, then things are not going to align and you're not going to get the funding that you need. So you have to understand the different stages. You need to understand the different industries in which investors are in. And so raising money becomes a full-time job because you have to understand, you have to find the, the perfect people. I understand that you invest in this category. I understand that you invest in early stage companies. I understand that you're more hands-on, you're more hands-off. Whatever the case is, you really, really need to understand the mindset of that investor. And then when those things align, then you're more likely or you have an increased chance of raising money. Um, that said, you have to find the right investor for you. I mean, this is, it, it is literally like a marriage, but this is a marriage that you cannot get a divorce from because once the documents are signed, you all are partners and you're, you're together and you just have to grind it out. The only way that you really can have that divorce is you have to buy that investor out and the problem is you needed that money for your business to begin with. So it's not like you have extra money that you can buy that investor out. So you have to think really, really carefully. This is a long-term investment or a relationship. And uh, really what it comes down to it is that not all money is, is going to be good, uh, good money because you just have to have that relationship with that investor knowing that you're all going to be working together for a long, long time. So how do we crack this code? And this is something called the growth flywheel. And we're going to touch on these three areas, your product, your team, and your customer. And when you get those things, then your business is going to grow. So we'll jump in with your customers. And you have to, so when you're starting your business, you need to know who you're building that business for. And I don't want you to think about who your first customers are. I want you to think about who your ideal customers are. Because your first customers, they can be your mom, they can be your close friends, and they're, they're going to support you because they want to support you, because they know they love you. But the thing is, is that once you're done uh, wor working with them, then you have to go and find those ideal customers. So find those ideal customers and think about who does this pro the product or the service you have ultimately pro solve the problem for. So like from a... Um, from a painting standpoint, like what type of painting service uh, uh, do I provide? Is it high end? Is it industrial? Is it uh, residential? You know, you have to understand who those ideal customers are. So that way, when you go and market your business, you're marketing to the right person. Um, once you identify who that right person is or those right customers are, focus on the top 10% of those people that are giving you that engagement. And I want you to know who, though, that, type of, uh, who that type of customer, who they are, how they think, what their problems are. You need to understand like, their, their problems better than they do. And if you think about it from a consumer side, it makes sense. If you want to go uh, and get new tires for your car, for example, you, you, you wanna make sure that you talk to that person like, oh, yeah, I totally, I used to have that make and model of a car. Hey, I love that. And when, these are the tires that work best for me. You're building confidence. You're gaining that, that credibility. And so you're, then you feel comfortable doing business with that, that tire salesman. Same, same holds true when you're with your business. You need to know the problems that, that your customers or potential customers face better than they do. And that's how every successful company that I've worked with, they understand their customers better than anyone else. 
And the thing about it is, so these are the, when I talk to founders and they get really, really frustrated that they can't raise money, you have to have these three things. And so you have to find your customers. Without customers, you just have that idea. And again, ideas, they don't have any value. You need to make sure that you have those customers. You need to be able to build your, your startup in one simple sentence. Uh, Uber exists to connect riders with drivers for faster and cheaper rides. Everyone understands what Uber is. They get it really, really quick. They don't, you, they don't go into the technologies that they have. They, go, they don't go into the roadmap. Innovate Hampton Roads for the same thing. We celebrate entrepreneurship and innovation um, for the rest of the world. I mean, we, we are putting Hampton Roads on the map. This is one stop of the, that we're doing this today in Newport News. We're recording this, it's gonna, and then we're gonna put out a story so the rest of the world can see what we're doing. If you can't say what your company does simply, then your, your potential customers aren't gonna be able to understand it either. I mean, they, it, just, it needs to be a one sentence, super simple, and then people get it. They're gonna remember. And like, it's counterintuitive, but you can't be all things to all people. Like, so when you're a new business, you wanna be like, oh yeah, I can do this, and I can do that, and I can do this, and I can do that too. And then it's just like, what do you do again? And so you have to, you can't hedge your bets on multiple things in your startup. You gotta find that one area and you, you just gotta go all in and focus on that one area. Um, a lot of people talk about product market fit and how your product or your service fits within the market. Before we get there, I want you to think about founder market fit. And what I mean by that is, do you and your team use a service that you are providing? And if you aren't using the service that you're providing, like if you were to go and find, get someone else to paint your, paint your house or paint your place, that, that, that's a red flag, right? You, you, you have to use your product and service. So like with Innovate Hampton Roads, we have a consolidated calendar of all the events that are happening. And if I need to find a, an event, or if I need to find the address to the event that we're going to or register, I go to Innovate Hampton Roads ca uh, calendar for that information. So you, are you using your own product? Um, when it comes to getting to know your customer, how are your customers using that product? Because you may have an idea, you know how you want them to use your product, but if they're, if they're using it a completely different way, you need to understand that in the sense of why is it that people aren't using it the way that I intended? Or two, if they're using it in a different way, that may unlock a whole different revenue stream that you didn't even think was an option for your business. So again, your customers are gonna tell you everything that you want to know and don't be afraid to talk to your customers. So many people when they're young, in terms of the, the, the age of their business, they, they're afraid to talk to their customers because they don't want to hear that bad news. And it was just like, but if you're really transparent and you lean into that vulnerability, they want to support you, they want you to succeed. And so lean into that and find out, what can I do better? You know, it, they will be there to support you, I promise. So we've talked about how you can get get your customers, you identify who your customers are. Next thing you really you need to have is you have to have a product. Without a product, you're not gonna have any customers. So what we talk about is an MVP, that is a minimal viable product. Everyone has an idea like where they want the business to be long-term. I wanna have a restaurant in this community, but it's gonna cost $2 million in order to do it. Yeah, that is not your minimal viable product. So people get stuck on this because they want to start with the end state first. You've got to start really, really small and really, really early. So if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. And what I mean by that is you don't have to have the perfect logo. You don't have to have the perfect website. You don't have to have all your technology in place. Like a lot of businesses that are ripe for disruption are people that are carrying around a clipboard and a piece of paper. I mean, that, like, that, is just, that is ripe for disruption. And you may not be able to have this entire 
technology platform built, but if you can go from a clipboard to an Excel spreadsheet, now you, you, you've, that's your minimal viable product. So what it, what is, uh, how minimal is minimal? Or you have to be able to solve the problem. So instead of scribbling on a piece of paper, you're now entering into a spreadsheet. And then you can take that to the next step. You don't need a lot of money to do that. But these are all small steps to validate where your business is going. How valuable is viable? Customers have to actually be willing to pay for it. So if you have a, if you have a, a cookie company, your customer on the back end, they don't know if you're inputting this into an Excel spreadsheet. They just want good cookies that are fresh, delivered when they're supposed to be delivered, and the price is right. Yeah. So if you're doing all this on a spreadsheet, that is your minimal viable product because you're able, customers are paying for it, you're getting the job done. Um, another thing that I see often is that how do you retain your customers? You, how do you have that personal touch in terms of is, be relational? This is, don't be transactional with your business that you have. So when you have that one customer, delight them. You should do whatever you can to satisfy and exceed expectations more than anyone else. And then continue to, how do you follow up with them? Hey, it's been a while since you play, play, uh, placed your last order. I'd love to, love to talk to you. Or we have, a new pro, uh, we have a new type of cookie that just came out. Whatever the case is, have that personal touch, have that human touch so that you can remind them of the product and then you're building upon that customer base. And, that, and you'll, you can already start to see things are starting to work when it comes to your customers and your product. And you, you, you need to delight them. But in order to do that, you have to have your team in place. So one of the things that a lot of that people happen with, if you're a solo founder, a so, you're in this all yourself, you're wearing many, many hats. You're the CEO, you're the chief financial officer, you're the marketing person. You are sending out all the invoices, you're depositing the checks, you're doing everything. And next thing you know, you're doing the jobs of what 15 people should be doing. So with that, you need to understand and hire and build out your team so that everything can get done. So start, do you need a co-founder? Most of the time it is yes especially if you are a first time founder, you need to be able to offset that, that stress, the loneliness. Starting a, starting a business is extremely difficult. You're, I say it all the time, your highs are really high, your lows are really, really low. You have to understand what, what your why is so that you will can wake up in the morning and get after it and get started all over again. But when you, so when you have a co-founder, you can lean on one another. <clears throat> and this is normally an animated GIF, but with a co-founder, that, that airplane now has two engines. So if one engine goes down, you still have another engine that's working that you can bring the plane in for a landing or you can keep flying for a little bit until uh, then you can land it, fix that engine, and then you can take off again. But it also allows you to divide and conquer. <clears throat> Um, so you want to make sure that you're bringing someone in that complements you. You don't want to bring in someone identical to yourself. So if you like are both salespeople and none of you, neither of you are technical, you didn't do your business any favors. You still need to go out and find a technical person. So hire to offset your talents. That way you can divide and conquer. And really what it comes down to is if you have, if you're, if you're doing the work, if you're working 40 hours a week and you bring on a co-founder and you're both doing 40 hours a week, now you're, you're, you're moving at a pace that's 80 hours a week. So you're, you're able to do more with less as opposed to on the flip side, if you're by yourself and this is a side hustle and you're only able to put in five hours a week, that, pe that person that's putting 40 hours a weekend, they're working eight times faster. They're gonna to get to the finish line eight times faster than you are. Or if you have a, a co-founder and you're both putting that time in, you know, now you're, you're, just, you're moving, moving much, much faster. And VCs, if, uh, 
investors, venture capital, they want to see a co-founder because they want to make sure that this business has an opportunity to succeed if one of the, the co-founders doesn't, doesn't make it. And it happens. Every relationship at the very beginning is super, nothing's ever going to go wrong. We love each other. 50-50. We're in this for life, you know, and then things just don't work. The first time that it's really, really a struggle, then that's when things start to crumble. Um, but with that, how do you fix? Who, how do you fix? Uh, pick that co-founder. So again, you you need to identify the skills that you have, and then you need to be complementary to the to that that potential co-founder. Finding talent is going to be really, really, it's it's going to be tough. I mean, it's tough just to find people to work as it is right now, but certainly the whole the adage is hire slow, fire fast. And the thing that you do have as a startup, though, is that you have unique benefits in terms of you can be really flexible. You can, you know, how you get the work done, you know, you all can determine that. You set the culture, you set the hours, you set. Uh, possibly the salaries of how you're going to get paid. Those are all things that are attractive. But you have, when you work for a big company, there's the, sure, the stability might be there, but it's a big company, and the time to turn that, that ship is a long time. Whereas when, when you're working in a startup, you can move on the fly. And then like you can just, all right, this isn't working. We're going to pivot, and we're going to change. So some people, so people are attracted to both sides. So um, you need to understand what your culture is as a company, and you need to start building that culture, and you can attract the talent that you need. But you need to have that team. A lot of people will talk about, I'm just going to outsource everything. There's good and there's bad to that. HR, administrative work, finance and accounting, good things that you can uh, outsource. I always get a little squeamish when a uh, founder is like, I hate to sell. I am not a salesperson. I'm just going to hire for sales. But the reality is, is that as the founder of your company, you are going to be the number one salesperson forever and ever because you know the mission, you feel it in your heart, and you are just naturally are going to be the number one salesperson. The other aspect, another thing that's not, you can do it, but it's not a long-term strategy is like your tech. If you are building out a mobile app, for example, yeah, you can outsource that to India or you can outsource that to another country. But the problem is, is that they don't work for you. And if they, if, if, they, if relationships go bad, they're out they have all the institutional knowledge in terms of how the business was built and now you're going to have to start all over from scratch so there's you, you really need to think about that and especially if you're looking to raise money from investors they want to make sure that all that technology was built in-house you all own the code you have access to the code you have you you own the ip or else it's going to become really really difficult um when you bring people on board, I just put this, if you're looking to give equity, then you can certainly give equity, but you, you don't, there's only so much. You only can cut the pie so many different uh, ways. And this is a whole topic within itself, but again, before you go down that 50-50, split the pie down the middle, like a co-founder, a third co-founder, 10%, a VP, uh, one to two percent, and you can see the other numbers there. But the thing is, like, you want to make sure that that is you give that equity over time. You just don't they you don't just give it to them on day one and be like, Merry Christmas, here you go. You now on paper own what percentage of this company? So they need to earn that over time. What's called a vesting period. And so if you do give somebody, say you give a third co-founder nine percent. You may want to vest that over three years. And so after year one, they get 3%. After year two, they get the next 3%. And then after year three, then they, they fill out that 9%. But you want to make sure that they're with you for the long term, uh, just a, a way to protect yourself. And they're there for you to reference later. 
But with that, you now have the flywheel. And so what it comes down to, you're delighting customers. And when you're doing that, you're able to increase the revenue that your business generates. And then with that increased revenue, you can take that funding and then you can improve upon your team. And then when you improve upon your team, your product is gonna to continue to get better. And when your product continues to get better, now you're delighting more customers. And then with more customers, you're generating revenue. So like all this starts to work. And then so as, you're, as this is working, now all of a sudden, you are in control. You are not the one going to the banker or the investor saying, I need this money in order to survive. You may find out that you don't need to raise any money at all. And you can keep all the equity and ownership of your company for yourself. And that's the whole idea. You want to protect as much ownership as you possibly can. So when you're doing that, as you're delighting these customers, you need to track that growth. And the thing is, we all understand that you're really, really early. And I've invested in companies that are pre-revenue that have not had any customers. So it's great. You get your first customer. You go from one customer to two customers. And then from two customers, you might go to four customers. But track that growth. And over time, you show what that trajectory looks like. The same thing with that increased revenue. You want to show that increase uh, of revenue over time. And then what happens there is now investors are like, all right, this company is continuing to grow. The risk is not there for something that's because there, there's validation there. This, I feel more comfortable. If they've done this over 30, 60, 90 days, then we're going to continue to, that trajectory is going to continue to increase. So, that, so life is good. That's what we want to work towards. Improve product. What I mean by tracking the improvements there. Every time you improve the product, like in terms of, like if for a mobile app, you added this functionality, or if you're a service company, you added this particular service, or you're able to get this piece of equipment and you're able to do the jobs that much faster or that much more efficient, or the quality is that much better. Track how you're improving that product or service side. Investors, they wanna see that as well because that enables you to delight more, uh, delight more customers and generate more revenue. And you have all that, and you're, you're off to the races. You need those three things. You can get by with two of those. But you, if you don't have a product and you don't have customers and you don't have a team to do it, you, going back to the idea, all you have is an idea. And I hear thousands of ideas, not on a weekly basis, but perhaps a, a thousand ideas a year and you, they just, you need to validate them. So if you can't get a, a meeting, ask yourself, do I have a product, do I have customers, and do I have a team? And that will answer your question. The, co the companies that I see that complain about this area, they're missing those things. On the flip side, the, the companies that are doing better than anyone else, they have all three of those things. Um, The other thing, uh, the mistake that, that can be made is that you're a startup, you have lots of time because you don't have customers that are controlling your calendar. And so then when the opportunity comes and you hear like, oh, I'm gonna have a meeting with a, an investor or I'm gonna meet with a banker or something like that, you just schedule that for whenever you possibly can. And the thing is, so like you need to make a concerted decision. I, I am going to raise money now. And what I want you to do is schedule all those meetings on one particular day. So maybe it's, all right, I've, let's schedule that meeting. Two weeks from now, we're going to do it. And then we're going to go back to back meetings because you're only as good as the last presentation or pitch that you gave. From the investor side of the house, you know, they all have egos. And if you're like, I gotta wait for two weeks. Now you're creating this fear of missing out that this company is too busy for me. What is this company, why? What makes them think that they're too busy for me? Stick, stick to the timeline. If, it's, if you got an hour, stick to an hour. And then if you, if you run out of time, schedule the next meeting. Even if you, I'm not, I'm not saying a lie. But if you, if you have to end the meeting on Zoom because you are going to the next meeting, 
or the perceived next meeting, again, that creates, it's like seeding the chip tip jar. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, all right, there's, there's something that's going on here. This person is busy. So schedule all your meetings on the same day. And then when you're hearing, when you're uh, doing these meetings, if you get whatever questions you get, I want you to write down all of these questions. Because if, if you get a question over and over again, there's something wrong with your narrative. There's something wrong with the story. And you need to address that in your story so that you answer that question. What happens when an investor's mind is that like, they, get, they get stuck on something that is not adding up. And then they've stopped listening to you because it doesn't make sense to them. So write down those questions. Keep a list of everybody that you meet with. And now you're building out your investor list, the, the, the potential people that you can get money from. And then you should be doing monthly or quarterly updates of the progress of your business. And you need to add them to those monthly updates. Because with investors, it may not be, it's not a, necessarily a hard no, I'm not going to do this. It could be just a matter of you haven't, you haven't been in business long enough. You're not generating enough revenue. You, we're waiting for you to get a couple more customers before you're on board. Or from a banking standpoint, you need to be in existence for X amount of time. And perhaps you just haven't hit that yet. But when you're sending these monthly or quarterly updates of, you know, this is my progress, one, you don't know who's, who that investor knows. Their networks are gonna be really, really big. Or you may just magically hit the milestone that they're looking for, or you're just proving the point that the, the, the something, some sort of litmus test that they were looking for, and now, and you're good. So you gotta keep that relationship warm. So monthly updates, what should you include in your monthly updates? The current status of your business. So how many customers do you have? How much revenue are you generating? What's the size of your team? How have you grown from the last report? Um, hopefully you're growing in terms of revenue, cash in the bank, and then what, what we call runway in the business. So if you have $100,000 in the bank and you spend $10,000 a month, your business can survive for 10 months without generating any new revenue. So that's what runway is. Just like with the plane, you need runway in order to take off or to land. So you want to extend runway as far as you possibly can. The ideal scenario, if you had 18 to 24 months of runway, then you're in great shape, especially if you're looking to raise money because if an investor is not gonna invest in a company that has three or four months of runway, because at that point, it's gonna take you six months to raise additional capital. So that investor's like, I'm not gonna get into this because the only option I have is let you go out of business or I'm gonna to have to invest more money to protect the money that I put in the, the first time. So you want to, how do you extend your runway? Increase the revenue that you're generating and then go into the next line, reduce the amount of money that you're spending. So, and the update. Talk about how you're increasing revenue, your cash, and your runway, but on then with your current spend, you want to reduce how much money that you're uh, spending so that you can extend that runway out. It's not one of those things where you, uh, you get a ton of money and you're like, it's party time, you know, company party. And then that's just not how, I would love that that's the way that it works, but it can't. You know, it's just like right now with the companies that I've invested in, like, right, like they have to make really, really difficult decisions. They have to reduce the amount of money that they're spending because it's really the survival of that business. I mean, otherwise, you're gonna run out of money. So what your burn rate is, how you're reducing that, includes your highlights and then your upcoming, uh, upcoming challenges that you have and what you need help with. And Investors want to see you succeed. If you succeed, they succeed. So whatever challenges that you have, good news does not get better, or bad news does not get better over time. So if you need people, if you, you know, we're gonna need, we're gonna be looking to raise, and then to raise more capital in the next four months, whatever the case is, you need to ask them for help and you'll be surprised what they're able to do. When you have all those things, You've built the credibility that you're looking for, and that 
the time to need a banker, the time to need an investor, that is, if you wait to establish that relationship to the time that you need it, you've waited too long. So you need to have those relationships now and, in, and, and leverage those as long as you possibly can so that they're there when you need them. But I am Tim Ryan, and that is James Doe. That is our contact information. That's how to get in touch with us. Do get connected with us. We want to hear your stories. We want to share everything, that, that the great things that you're doing because great things are happening. Is that the tagline? Was that the tagline in Newport News? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we want to share those successes. We want to share those stories. I mean, we are all about my goal in life. I want to build billion dollar companies and I would love to have a billion dollar company here. It would change everything. I mean, it's just, your success is our success, and that's how we measure it. But that's everything that I have. I'm happy to answer any questions, or I think that I was able to catch up so that we finish on time. I do have a question. Yeah. And so on those monthly updates, if, for example, maybe things aren't going well, is it down month? Is this still a good practice to just maybe send an update with what the numbers are and give some context? So yep, 100%. Okay. Great question. Yeah, because then it shows like, yeah, I, I understand what's happening. This is how we're going to fix it. Or even if you don't know what's happening, you're like, I would love some insight or some help on how we can correct this downward trend. But yeah, for sure, um, adding some context as to why you, know, you may have lost a key client or you, you, you expected some, some churn, uh, customers are no longer customers for whatever reason. But we've got a plan to bring, those, bring, the, bring new customers in. That said, it's cheaper to keep the customers you have than it is to go out and find new customers. So delight those customers and they'll, they can't help but tell their friends. Tim, can you talk about for just a moment the, on the other side of the psychological aspect of the investor, a couple of the things that they're looking for when you talk about investors investing in individuals and not necessarily the business per se. What are a couple of those things that really stand out? Yeah, it's, well, there's a lot of different things that come into play, but passion, your why, the, 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 the why, in terms of why are you solving this problem, are really, really important. Um, if you're a, a second time or a third time founder, that could be really, that's, that's really important. Like for me, I would rather, I, I would invest in a second time founder or a third time founder before I would invest in a first time founder with the mindset that they've learned so much from failing the first time and second time that they're not going to make those mistakes again, that's invaluable. And so many people are like afraid to say, that, yeah, I, I, I had a failed venture. But you learned a lot along the way, and that's a good thing. Um, those are a couple aspects to, to look at, but it really... It, it does, it comes down to those three things. If you've got a founder that has a really solid why, they know the business, they know their customers, they have customers, the product is so good that people can't help but tell each other about it, and they've got a team to deliver. I mean, those, that, that is what it is that you're looking for, and that, that's how I evaluate you know, companies that I would consider investing in. And it's just uh, so they had to round everything out. This is really unorthodox in terms of I'm not going to tell you you need to do this to, go, uh, to get money from a banker or an investor. It really comes down to the fundamentals of your business. And I just have to just be super, super real with you all that you got to grind, grind through it. It's not easy, but no one's expecting you to have a thousand uh, customers the first week that you're in business. This is a seven or eight year overnight success story.